Welcome to Falmouth. If you're a visitor, this is where surf and sun meet for fun. If you're a resident, this is where you'll find the businesses and the resources necessary to fill all of your needs. If you're a business person, this can be your home. Join with other men and women who work together to make this a sustainable economy year-round. Welcome to Falmouth, Cape Cod. of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Um, before we get going this evening, I have an announcement. Uh, the Charter Review Committee is holding a public meeting on Thursday, August, uh, pardon me, August the 30th, this Thursday at 7 p.m. at the Falmouth Public Library. This will be to um, summarize and get public comment in any and all of their changes for the potential charter for the fall town meeting. So if you'd like to participate, we would hope you would do so. Um, we would move into uh, the first item up tonight is continued wetland hearing, Toby Lane Associates, parcel 3A, knock, uh, knock about uh, trail East Falmouth. I have received a letter from the um, the engineer representing them. The applicant uh, continues to attempt to resolve matters with the butters and at the proposed project. We expect the issue to be resolved in the near future. Uh, however, uh, since it is unclear as to when this specifically the matter will be resolved, we hereby request uh, a withdrawal without prejudice of the special permit application. So if I could have a motion that would allow for withdrawal without prejudice uh, so the applicants can uh, work uh, together with the neighbors. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you very much. Uh, we will uh, go to the summary of actions. Next, if that's all right, because we do have a little bit of time, because that was a scheduled time issue. First off would be to approve request for a beach wedding uh, permit, uh, Reagan, Bristol Beach, a 915-12. Do I have a motion? Does anyone have any questions? Well, let me go right down the list, I guess, pardon me. Item number one, do I uh, have any holds? Item number two, designate Academy Lane. Hold, please. Okay. Item number three, execute license agreement between the Town of Falmouth and Open Cape uh, Corporation. I'd like to hold that. Item number four, four approve temporary construction easement, Chappaquate Road. So do I have a motion to uh, on item number one and item number four? Move to approve items one and four. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? I have it. Um, designate uh, Academy Lane as Olympic Square. Mrs. Flint. Yes. Um, I when I uh, discussed this with the board last week and got your approval to uh, to hold this Olympic event, which is uh, honoring the achievements of uh, Falmouth Olympians, we had I had mentioned to you that we had a sort of informal designation some years back. Um, weren't able to find that in the minutes, but I think. Uh, in terms of requesting this designation, it doesn't and cannot change the official name of Academy Lane because that's what it is and it's in the, in the road book and roads and streets. But for ceremonial purposes, uh, since it already holds uh, the rock for Colleen Point, who was a gold medalist in 1998, and uh, we called it Olympic Way, we'd just like to change it to Olympic Square. Um, 
and it doesn't make it official, it makes it more ceremonial. And I also would like to add that this event is going to take place on September 8th, which is the week from Saturday. There is a swim event that will begin at 7 a.m. on Surf Drive that is actually being well coordinated by the uh, Falmouth Swim Club, and, or by the swim, Cape Cod Swim Club, and also by uh, Falmouth Aquatics. And uh, we expect to have up to 100 kids swimming. And um, uh, our Olymp Olympian gold medalist will be there, Eric Vent, and encouraging the swimmers. And then there will be a parade of Walker Street uh, following that. And then the, the ceremonies itself will take place uh, approximately 11 o'clock on Saturday morning at Peg Noonan Park. And, uh, and you are all invited, as particularly the chairman, uh, would, to make some welcoming remarks. <clears throat> some of our state representatives will be there, and um, Eric's family, I think uh, there are about 50 or 60 people, uh, who have his friends and family who will be there. And um, I, I think it will be a really nice event. There'll be a lot of children there, because this is really all about the kids, about inspiring them and encouraging them and letting them know that uh, that they can that they can do this too. So uh, we're calling it going for gold, and that could mean lots of things for for young people. And so we're hoping that it does inspire them to uh, um, to use this event as a way of knowing that that maybe they can do something like this too. So I hope you all can come on Saturday the eighth. So would you like? I to make a motion to approve uh, the, name the of this is designating Academy Lane as Olympic Square. Okay, <coughs> motion and second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Thank you very much. Next up would be execute license agreement between the Town of Falmouth and Open Cape Corporation. I'd ask uh, the Town Council to just merely explain to this board what this uh, very technical agreement is so the, uh, the novice uh, of us in the legality aspect of it. Mr. Chairman, Frank Duffy, Town Council. The Open Cape Group uh, wants to use the water tower for installation of some of the infrastructure to, uh, which will provide the services, uh, I think it's internet and broadband services to the, to the town. Um, we went through this some time ago um, when they proposed to lease the uh, top of the uh, space on the top of the water tower. And we informed them that they really couldn't lease it. We, we didn't have the authority to do that. We would have to go through town meeting to, to get that. Um, the most we could authorize under the circumstances was a license, which is a revocable right to use real property. It doesn't create any actual ownership or, or interests uh, in the property itself. So that was finally submitted um, to my office for review, and the same document was submitted to, I think, some other communities around um, a license agreement, um, which I reviewed, and I made some modifications to it. Um, the, the agreement provides that they may erect their infrastructure on top of the water tower, uh, that it has to be done according to plans approved by the water department. There's a number of protocols that they have to meet in terms of providing power and notice and rights to access the uh, the water tower. Um, it's a one-year agreement and it can be terminated by the Board of Selectmen at any time it's deemed necessary for the purposes of the Town of Falmouth. So the, the interests of the Town of Falmouth are paramount here. It's a, it's a maximum one-year license to put this equipment there. Now it's been represented to us that in the meantime, in, in the one-year period of time, this group is going to go through the County of Barnstable to create some kind of a group purchasing effort among the various communities on the Cape to have this, have similar agreements put in place in the other communities. Um, but they have one year to do it, and if they can't do it, they're going to have to take the material down. Uh, this, I believe, has been reported to them, and they're willing to go ahead. Um, but in any event, with the, with the changes I made to the agreement, limiting it to one year and limiting it as a revocable license so that the Board of Selectmen can tell them to take it down at any time they deem it the paramount interest of the Town of Falmouth then it will come down. Is this, okay. uh, is this renewable? The one no. Year? no. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, well, just to make a comment, um, since I'm a little familiar with Open Cape, is that this is just, as uh, Frank said, a one-year agreement. The other 14 towns have already signed on to this type of a license for the one year. And then uh, if the county, through Open Cape, as it moves on to become the regional umbrella services, um, as you say, may come up with some sort of a standard agreement that all of the towns could participate in, but that's the year that will well, uh, this is take for make that right. happen. This is going to be going to become a permanent arrangement. And I understand that we as a town are going to receive some benefit from this. Right. We're going to receive the services. The county has to put together a package that can be approved by all the communities, so right. it's up to them now. Right. Okay. That's correct. Okay. So do I have a motion to approve? So move. Second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Both? I have it. Um, Next up, it's, it's 710, is the Long Pond uh, Study Status Report presentation. Mr. Jack. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. What we have this evening is a short presentation on where we are on the feasibility study for Long Pond. Uh, the study itself is involving uh, bench scale testing, which is done in a laboratory, pilot testing, which are small scaled down versions of full scale treatment processes physically at the Long Pond facility and then ultimately evaluating all the data and comprising a report to be provided to the town in order to make a decision. Uh, the real basis for all of this effort is a change in the regulations under the surface water treatment rule which essentially means that the town is going to have to make a decision one way or the other to enhance the treatment processes at Long Pond. It will either be enhanced disinfection capability or the town would opt to build a treatment system. So we have a teaming arrangement with two engineering firms that represent us as our consultants. Uh, Mr. Patrick O'Neill is a professional engineer with the firm of Tate and Howard, and uh, Russell Ford is Dr. Ford, and he represents CH2M Hill. So both of them will be working in tandem on the presentation this evening, and of course, if there's any questions, uh, we'll be available to answer them. Thanks. Go right ahead. Good evening. Do you need us to dim the lights? Are you going to use this uh, at this point? It's up to you if you can see. Uh -huh. uh, we'll probably ask for a little bit more slide. Great. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for having us in tonight. Uh, my name is Patrick O'Neill with Tate and Howard. And again, I'm here with Dr. Russell Ford, CH2M Hill, to provide an update on the Long Pond Treatment Feasibility Study. As you know, Long Pond is a 150-acre groundwater-fed surface water body. The town has been very proactive over the years and acquired or controlled the entire watershed of the pond. This has gone a long way to protecting the water quality, and as a result, it is very good. But again, it is a pond uh, subject to seasonal variations in water quality, taste and odor, algae, and obviously the microbiological activity that can occur at the surface water body. The supply provides currently 60 to 70 percent of your summer demand uh, every year, so it's a vital piece of your water supply system. Current regulatory status, being a surface water supply, it's subject to the surface water treatment rule. That rule is geared towards reduction of pathogens in drinking water from surface water supplies, but not only that, groundwater supplies under the direct influence of surface water. Within that, there's a filtration waiver, which the town sought and received in the early 90s. That waiver eliminated the need for filtration but requires other monitoring and treatment in order to maintain the waiver, such as turbidity monitoring, raw water biological monitoring, CT disinfection, which is currently in place, which involves disinfection with chlorine and contact time, and additional monitoring of the distribution system for chlorine residual to make sure you have chlorine throughout the distribution system. The next step in that, which Ray referred to, is the long-term to enhance surface water treatment rule. That's coming up. The regulatory deadline is 
this October. And you're required to have additional disinfection in place, which will treat for cryptosporidium. That's going to involve a, an additional treatment process that you don't have already because chlorine alone, even with CT contact time, will not inactivate cryptosporidium. So you're looking at additional disinfection with either UV, ozone, or chlorine dioxide. And the pictures here on the top is a uh, ozone system, and on the bottom is uh, UV reactors. The other piece that's coming into play is the disinfection byproducts rule. If you chlorinate a surface supply with organics, you develop disinfection byproducts, and they're regulated, and they're tested on the distribution system. So as you add chlorine to meet the filtration waiver, you're complicating the other end, which is the disinfection byproducts rule. Currently, there's the stage two disinfection byproducts rule, which comes into play this fall, which is going to change how you monitor for disinfection byproducts. Again, it may complicate compliance issues. The next piece is emerging contaminants. Um, you may have heard this talk of endocrine disruptors or personal care products. Um, these are emerging contaminants that are being looked at now. Uh, EPA also has a program for unregulated contaminant monitoring where routinely they'll test public water supplies all over the country for a variety of chemicals and determine whether or not they should be monitored in the future or regulated in the future. So any one of those could come into play as far as compliance in the future. This feasibility study, we're looking at water quality, both what's on record uh, with the town, plus additional water quality testing we're conducting. Uh, as part of the pilot. Bench scale testing, just small scale. We take samples from the pond, bench test a variety of treatment technologies, and with that, determine what processes will be tested in the field, on a, as Ray mentioned, on a larger scale to evaluate both how well they can meet the goals for treatment and then that data will be used for equipment sizing and ultimate, ultimately determining the size of a potential treatment plant and uh, siting of a treatment plant. So part of the study is once various treatment alternatives are determined, we will size a treatment plant with the combination of processes and then determine in a preliminary basis where it could be sited on the property, and with that, develop cost estimates with a better focus on the technology to be used and where the plant would be located. And I'm going to turn it over to Russell. For the Thank you, Patrick. So one of the first things we did was looked at bench scale testing to assess some of the key processes you might need to use in the water plant. Um, so if this helps you like scale down. There's a lot of processes out there. So the first thing we did was took a collection of water, characterized the water, took a snapshot in time. The next thing we did was looked at different coagulants. These are things that allow the water to uh, make particles that can be filtered. We tested different coagulants to get an idea of what would maybe be better to test on a full scale or pilot and full scale system. Then we looked at various forms of oxidation ozone, chlorine dioxide, things that would actually break up compounds, things that would assess taste and odor, things that would help with disinfection. We looked at those in the bench scale to see, to develop the key criteria for we could, so we could design that in the conceptual level. We looked at something called MIAX, which is a magnetic ion exchange resin. It's uh, for organic removal. <clears throat> so we looked at that as another process that's out there that could be used on the water plant. One of the key things on the long pond plant is that since you just disinfect right now, these treatment processes, you know, there's no direct experience on that water source. So the bench scale gives you a little snapshot in time to look at the processes to kind of, you know, confirm or deny some of the things you want to move forward. The next thing we looked at were membranes. <clears throat> we looked at microfiltration, ultrafiltration type membranes. These are mainly used for particulate removal, 
to remove the pathogens, Giardia, Cryptosporidium, also remove turbidity from the water. We looked at those on the bench scale. And then <clears throat> lastly, we were looking, you know, look at granular media filtration after coagulation to like a regular filter plant. You might hear me say conventional filter. That would be regular filtration. <clears throat> so after we did the bench scale work, we actually met with the DPW and Department of uh, Board of Health representatives, and we actually we developed about 25 potential treatment trains that could be used, you know, at the plant based on the results of the bench scale testing. We took that, developed some evaluation criteria, looking at ease of operation, impacts of water quality, addressing taste and odor, sustainability, and we did that, and we broke those down to maybe the three or four trains that would potentially make sense to, you know, I should turn to be five trains that would make sense to be pilot tested. As everybody said, pilot testing gives us a demonstration. So bench scale is a snapshot in time. Pilot testing is conducted, we conducted testing in the winter during February through April, and we're conducting pilot testing currently right now at the site, looking at these processes to see how they perform in real time. You know, theory sometimes meets reality, and pilot testing is a way to figure that out. So we looked at coagulation, we're looking at different, we, we chose a coagulant, which is a pyaluminum chloride, aluminum salt to coagulate with. We're looking at ozonation in terms of uh, disinfection and for, you know, taste and odor compounds. So we're using, we're looking at ozone, the impact of that on the water source. And we're looking at direct filtration. Direct filtration is basically coagulation followed by filtration with no sedimentation process in between there. That, on a preliminary analysis, which, you know, those 20 trains, we did that. We did a, we did a conceptual cost on those to get a cost-benefit analysis. From that standpoint, direct filtration on paper looked like a, you know, something that could be cost-effective. You know, as we're finding in piloting, it's ongoing, but it's a little more of a challenge to do direct filtration. So, but those, that's why you pilot test. Dissolved air flotation is uh, a process that removes solids. It floats the solids away. So, whereas direct filtration has no clarification or settling process, this would go in front of the filter and it, flo it floats, floats your problems away, as they say. So if you have algae in the water, it floats the algae. It floats the turbidity, and it allows the filter to work. That's a process that's used a lot in New England communities and the type of water that you have here, cold water, low alkalinity, those kind of things. So we're, we're testing that. Uh, membrane filtration, we have a Paul uh, you know, MF uh, filter on site. Um, looking at that in two modes, direct coagulation. So we're adding coagulant on top of that seeing if it removes, and we did. We tried in the winter without coagulant. We determined based on the results of the test that we need to have coagulant, so the winter testing proved that, so we implemented that in the summer. The other thing we implemented based on um, the results of the winter testing and conversation with the, you know, DPW and the Board of Health, uh, you know, steering committee, is that dissolved the flotation in front of the membrane might actually be very good, so we were able to test that the summer, we added that to the treatment train to test to look at the results of that. So that's where we are at the piloting right now. It's ongoing, anticipated to be finished, say, end of you know, mid end of September with the pilot pilot testing uh, work that's done out there. Uh, before we go on, I just want to mention this is the actual oh. pilot equipment on site. The uh, top picture is, is the DAF unit. That's at Long Pond right now. This is the membrane provided by all all membranes. It's a membrane skid. It's fully automated with the PLC computer. Um, this is at the top of the DAF, and this is the float of actually the water from Long Pond. That's the material that's being removed as part of the DAF process right now. At Long So where do we go in the end? Once the piloting is done, we'll develop the final report. Uh, that will include the treatment alternatives, not only for the filtration option, but the compliance option for the additional disinfection required to meet LT2, because that's a decision, as Ray mentioned, you have to make. Uh, do, you, do you install additional disinfection now, or do you install filtration, depending on what your goals are for the future? As part of that, we'll be looking at the estimated capital and on end costs for the selected alternatives. Again, preliminary site layout, that's a 
big piece of the cost. So once we know the size of the plant, roughly, we'll see where it could be located and then what infrastructure is needed to uh, connect it to the distribution system. And permitting, which is can be a long process for these projects. So we'll provide a summary of permitting, both local and state and uh, the county permitting required for the project. And that's your long pond, and be glad to take any questions you might have. I, I can just start out by saying that this was probably the only presentation I remember as a member of the Board of Selectmen that appeared to be so far over my head I mean, in, in technology, uh, that we have so many options that we're really going to rely on your expertise as we move forward. Either that or I'm going to have to do a lot more research on this as we move forward as well. Pat? Um, I guess my question would be, and I don't know if it's even a rational question, but how much of a problem is the sediment in Long Pond, I mean, in relationship to maybe costs or um, ability to... Um, to work with it compared to maybe sediments of other surface water systems elsewhere in the state, or, or is that not even an issue? Mr. Chairman, can I back up to, yep. answer, to answer part of that question anyway? Um, for the benefit of, of those at home, I know that they did a great job in getting into the technical aspects of what's going on here, but what does it really mean? <clears throat> Long Pond being a surface water source, there are a lot of suspended solids in it. Uh, there are a lot of settled solids that are on the bottom and they can get turned up, churned up at different times of the year depending on storm events or pond turnovers which occur when water's at its greatest density. Um, but that's probably one of the bigger issues are the suspended materials in the water and that includes anything that is, that is floating around in there. So it could be silts, sediments, uh, microbes, algae, what have you. They pose a problem for most of the treatment trains, if you will. So if you look at surface water and the largest surface water plants in the country, one of the first things you have to do is deal with those suspended materials. And coagulation is one of the best processes and more cost effective processes to do that. So all it really means is similar to like when blood coagulates in that you apply a chemical um, because most of these things that are in the water that you want to get out are negatively charged at the uh, ionic level and the coagulant is usually positively charged by neutralizing the electrical charge of the particulates, then they can agglomerate together and they'll actually form a flock in a pool. And normally you're trying to get them heavy enough to settle out. That becomes important because with dissolved air flotation, that process is almost working in reverse. What's unique about Long Pond is the algae generally is at the surface. So it doesn't want to go down to begin with. Dissolved air flotation as a process is similar to coagulation, but it pushes the material up to the surface where it wants to be anyway, or floats. Um, as far as direct filtration versus membrane filtration, direct filtration is your conventional sand filter. And there's different types of media that could be employed in there, manganese green sand, anthrophil, charcoal, what have you, but that's similar to like the old pool filters would, would work. You just push water through a column of sand and it comes out cleaner at the bottom. Membrane filtration is easy to associate with reverse osmosis. If you have a reverse osmosis plant, you're taking a cellulose uh, fiber type of membrane and you are trying to force water through it and it has very, very small pores. So it goes microfiltration, ultrafiltration, nanofiltration, and ultimately reverse osmosis. So the membranes that we are talking about are on the lower and middle range of the scale here, but the whole process is very similar to an RO plant and that you're pushing water through a membrane and it has increasingly smaller pore sizes to be able to take out more and more constituents that are in the water. If you were to look at that graphically and associate it with things that people are more familiar with, you can take things like a hair, uh, a human hair, a particle of sand. Those are great at the microfiltration level. Then you start getting into things like vapors, uh, paint pigments. Uh, they would be more at the ultrafiltration range. They can also take out some bacteria, but can't take out viruses. If you're going for viruses, you need to get into the ultrafiltration and <laughs> nanofiltration range, range. So it's kind of giving you an idea of, of what the types of processes that there are out there. And that's why it's really very complicated. It's very dependent upon the source water quality in order to try to find the most effective and most efficient uh, and cost-effective means 
to achieve the end. So I don't know if I, I hope I answered your question. You no? <laughs> well, I didn't, well, you, no, you I gave didn't. me a little bit better interpretation, yeah. but, but it didn't answer her question. Well, it, it, how, much is the, how much is the problem in Long Pond compared to a relationship to cost, perhaps, compared to sediments in other types of surface water systems? I mean, are we dealing with a really complex issue here that could be very costly compared to maybe some other um, system somewhere else? Surface I, water system? I would have to say it's less costly. Less and costly. that's only because I'm familiar with some of the larger systems like Philadelphia water system that deals with some very muddy rivers like the Schuylkill and the Delaware River mm -hmm. where they have an extremely high suspended solids count and turbidity. Ours is more seasonal in nature. Um, algae is always present, but generally it's something seasonal in the summertime that we have to worry about. The turnovers, um, these are the ones that we generally see in May. And when water approaches 39 degrees, it's at its greatest density. A lot of people think that when it's at 32 and it's an ice cube, that that's when it's the heaviest. And if that were the case, why does an ice cube float? So at 39 degrees is when it's most dense. And so as the surface water or upper strata of the pond approaches that temperature in the spring, uh, and it could be either in the spring or in the fall, then it has a tendency to want to go down and push everything up that's below it. And then we have odor producing um, constituents on the bottom that get stirred up because that's where a lot of the organic matter is decomposing. So you have uh, methane and a number of other hydrogen sulfide products of decomposition that pose water quality problems and odor complaints. Then when it comes to algae itself, uh, one of the things that we look for is cyanobacteria, which is actually bacteria, not algae, but it's classified as such. And for those, they can produce toxins, they can produce noxious gases, and in the spring, generally, that is what we're seeing when we have odor complaints in the system. It's really a lot, a lot more to do with algae. So a couple of the important things about this, too, is that chemically what we're doing now is destroying the algae. So it does it in two ways. When you disinfect it, it either disrupts its metabolism or its ability to reproduce. Um, but it is literally chemically destroying the organism itself. And it didn't take it away, so it will decompose, and it can have other problems associated with it. If there were any toxins with it, then we've released those toxins. These processes are intended to get them out in whole, if you will, without actually um, disrupting that organism or tearing it down, if you will. Did you have any I comment? Just one comment. That Webner, over the last five or six years, has been having some really good educational programs on these very issues and systems as they, like from California, I remember somebody from there talking about it. So that's something that we should really look at with Webner and see if they can't continue those. So as this moves on, we can educate our community about what this means. Yes. Yeah. Doug. Um, do you feel that our following the study will prevent us from needing to do anything this fall by the requirements of chemical treatment for the water? Is this going to allow us to delay a little bit, or is there still a chance this fall we're going to have to do something anyway by the requirements of the water treatment? We, we are not going to be able to meet a deadline of October of having a system in place, all right? Great. So we're going to be requesting a time extension, and uh, the state will authorize that, but the town is still going to have to make a decision, and that decision would actually have to be probably the end of this year. Um, we would be looking at the Springtown meeting, and possibly a ballot vote if we were to do anything, uh, because we would have to get something in place before our time would expire on our extension. So it'll either be additional disinfection, which is faster and cheaper to do, or filtration, which is more expensive, takes a little more time, but the real difference is between an acceptable water quality and a good water quality. That's the, that's the reality. And maybe I'm reiterating the question, but you're saying if we decide to go with the filtration system, they'll say that's fine, go ahead and do it. You don't need to do the chemical right away. Correct. Okay. Correct. It's, it would be one or the other. Any right. questions? Um, since you're on this slide, this bottom middle picture, that it was mentioned that that's floating up. Is, is that what's actually in the water then? Is that... Right now, is, does that material get pumped through the pipes? Is it does, and it is, yes. Wow. That's in a, a full-scale plant, 
on the larger basins on a regular basis continuously throughout the day that is continuously removed it, it keeps surfacing and is continuously removed throughout the day on a surface water plant so that is true it's a pretty convincing case for filtration right there to see that um, there was another picture I think a couple of slides back and I was curious as to what it was another slide back I think right there the, the upper right what is that that's our intake so that's where the water's coming in. Yes. From the pond. So this is looking at it underwater. That's where it all starts. Yes, we send divers down to inspect them periodically. Okay. That looks. Let you know it's been clean since that picture was taken. <laughs> <laughs> it does build up over time, as you might expect, being in the pond. We had a picture taken years ago, and there was big fish right next to it, <laughs> big carp. Um couple of questions and one of the things that's been raised a few times and I didn't hear it mentioned here was the idea of just dropping wells around Long Pond and drawing the water using the grounds natural filtration um, why isn't that being studied or is it already a potential option or what it is an option it wasn't it wasn't brought into this because this is more to do with the pilot study mm -hmm. but overall the feasibility study will be evaluating all of these and that as well for the board to review um, oh, um, and the, the last question I had was, um, you mentioned there were basically five, and I, if I'm using the terminology correctly, treatment trains, I guess basically processes, if you will, that you're testing. Um, I'm assuming that we're also looking at uh, like a cost effectiveness ratio so that if we can get away with, you know, having a Chevy that we can, we'll get a Chevy instead of a Cadillac sort of thing. Yes, absolutely. In, in the end, in the final report that you're going to be looking at, you're going to have a number of treatment options uh, and their alternatives, if you will, uh, with all of the associated costs for uh, current construction and present worth, operation and maintenance, which is going to be important uh, consideration. Overall, so all of those costs will be provided as well on everything. Thank you. I just have one other question. Um, Have we kept the Board of Health in the, in the loop in regard to this process as well? Uh, Stephen Rafferty of the Board of Health and uh, Dr. John Waterbury um, were part of the initial consultations and continuing consultations on this, and yes. Okay. Um, so they, they are very, very knowledgeable. Uh, they bring a lot to the table. So it's not just a group. It's a, it's a very responsive group for the town. And, of course, this is... A regulatory issue, a departmental issue, a town issue, and a board of health issue. Right. Uh, I mean, I, I think we would look to them for a little of their expertise as a, as a board as well. Okay. Yes. Great. Thank you. Uh, any other questions from the board? When will we hear from you again? We'll be completing the pilot study the end of September. The end of September, they'll be evaluating the data and crunching the numbers, developing the final report. So I'd be looking at probably late November, December is when we'll be ready to come back with some something more conclusive. Okay. Uh, would probably this board would much prefer that rather than be in the crunch time of town meeting, which is early January. Uh, so we'll be talking about the budget and things of that nature at that time. I think that we need to devote some time to this, so if we can have this at least by early December, it would be wonderful. Yes. Okay. Great. Any, anybody else have any questions? Does anyone have any public comment? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. It. Next up is uh, West Falmouth uh, Playground update, uh, phase one uh, rebuilding. Hello. How are you doing? <laughs> okay. My name is Jake Barry. I'm going to update you on the West Falmouth Playground. Yeah. Someone's going to get you an easel that we can put that in. Um, so 
you got to go to the microphone right behind it. We've raised enough money to begin phase one of the installation, and this will include the swing set that you see. The swing set and the slide. The swing set and the slide, as well as a picnic table and two benches. We've raised about $15,000 so far, and that's going to be the installation will begin early September, Rocky said. He has it on the schedule for because they're working. It was supposed to be begin at the end of August, but they're busy with the schools right now, so he's going to start it early to mid-September. And um, we've had a lot of help with a lot of people as far as the fundraisers, especially Elsa Partan, uh, who helped us with the uh, spring swing dance that we had, which raised a lot of money for the project. Claire Gilbert, who's here today, she's um, part of the original family that started the playground, and the West Falmouth Village Association, as well as all their members and the continued support that we've had throughout the process. Um, Claire, I wanted to say a few can, words. Before we go any further, can you introduce yourself? I'm sorry. James oh. Berry. Pardon me? James Berry. James Berry. Yes. And you're the one who's spearheading this entire project. Right? Yes. Okay. Let's go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm Clara Hennessy Gilbert, West Falmouth Highway. I think I know why Jake Berry asked me to speak to you tonight because I knew West Falmouth before there was a Swift Park. In early 50s, Mrs. Alice Swift was concerned that there were nothing for the young people of the village of West Falmouth. She, no she donated four acres of land in the center of West Falmouth for a town park, and it's dedicated to her husband's memory. Around 1956, the West Falmouth Fire Station call men wanted a Little League baseball field and the Swift Park terrain was quite steep and lots of boulders, lots of trees. And the call men were able to use the town of Falmouth bulldozer on weekends when it was available and spent many months clearing the land, burying the bulldozers and flattening the one acre section of Swift Park that you see off Blacksmith Shop Road. And this is what Jake is planning for the park. Um, I look at Jake's proposal as history repeating itself with lots of people, lots of organizations working together toward a wonderful common goal. Uh, Mrs. June Atwood of West Falmouth, uh, Mrs. Swift's granddaughter, said that Mrs. Swift was a forward-thinking lady, very modern, and she always wanted the playground to be relevant. And she would support this project if she were here. And Mrs. Atwood also said that the Swift family 100% supports this program. For my children, it's going to be a wonderful playground. We'll be able to walk to it. I think the proposed improvements are very much needed. There's nothing really there anymore, and so this is needed and it's safe. And I believe that the improvements will make the Swift Park improvements relevant to the young people that it was intended to be used. So I would appreciate the board's support of this. Thank you. And I would just like to invite everyone to the grand opening, which will be on West Falmouth Celebration Day, October 7th at 11 a.m. And the rain date is October 8th at 11 a.m. at West Falmouth Park, Swift Park. Now, you're talking about this as phase one. Is there a phase two? Uh, yes, we're continuing our... Um, we're still trying to get more donations and setting up events for the other items that you see on the poster. And those we're hoping to be about the same time next year, if we can raise enough money. Uh, total cost, we have about 15 now. We're looking at trying to raise 50,000 for finishing the installation as well as maintenance. Great. Well, I wanna thank you and commend you for your uh, efforts. The town would be a better place if we had a lot of uh, young men and women that uh, step forward like yourself and uh, I know we have a great group out there and you, maybe you set a great example for everybody else. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else have anything else to say?
I just wanted to let you know that uh, Jake Barry did come before the Recreation Committee at our July meeting. The Recreation Committee unanimously, of course, supports this project, um, but we did want it to come before the Board of Selectmen for final approval before it started. And this is phase one. Um, the Recreation Committee will ask them to come before us before phase two starts. And would the Board of Selectmen like this to be in the same manner when phase two is ready? So and you'll be looking for a motion tonight to approve the We're looking for a motion to approve one. to move forward with phase one at the West Valmont Public Playground. As the treasurer of Together We Can, um, I will say they have raised over 15000 This phase one is costing about 13000 So um, they have 2000 going toward the phase two. And I really commend this young man. He started about a little over a year ago, and uh, he's done a great job. It is truly what Together We Can is all about, uh, is making this place a, a better community, and, and he's bringing some pride. So um, I really thank you. Um, I hope also, I'm just going to add in the future, if this young man comes before you for uh, fundraising, that you might consider waiving any permit costs, because the project is a public benefit, and it's public town-owned land. So I hope you consider that. Um, location of this at the park you're asking us to approve this my question is where at the park is this going to be located do you have the diagram okay i don't have it with me but i can tell you it's going basically in the same footprint where the swing set is right now okay uh it's going to be expanded a little bit still within the limits okay so it won't interfere with the uh, the baseball field or no. the softball little league field okay great any other comments yes Doug. I assume part of the cost is also for the ground preparation and the service that is going to be underneath the swing set and the slide. Yeah, we just have to buy the material and the border, and Rocky said that he would supply the rest as well as the material that's going to be on the ground. Okay. okay. Anybody else? I'll move approval of the West Falmouth Playground Project Phase 1. A second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Good luck. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Okay. Next up is uh, is to discuss the audit of the Falmouth High School building project. Uh, Mr. Putnam had asked uh, that we discuss this last spring. We did so before town meeting, uh, and uh, he has a, an additional a proposal uh, that he wanted to bring before the board so I'm going to give him uh, a little bit of uh, time here to present to the board this information thank you mr. chairman um, you should all have a, a copy in your packet this was a uh, the result of a conversation that I had um, many months ago now um, with mr. Allen uh, the proposal for uh, reviewing the the project the agenda item says it's an audit which is a little misleading because this is essentially a review of the project what an audit does and and of course there's there's already been an audit um, state mandated of the project but what an audit does is it basically looks at uh, the project and it says okay we spent one hundred dollars on a widget and um, do the receipts and, and all the paper trail does it actually match the fact that we did buy a widget for a hundred dollars but that's all an audit does. It doesn't answer the questions, and, and that's basically why I'm, I'm asking the board to look at this and, and consider supporting it, is that it doesn't answer the questions as to, should we have bought the widget in the first place? Did we need the widget, or did we, we told that we needed the, the widget, and therefore we bought it, but in the end, we could have done without it. Um, it doesn't answer the questions as to we bought the widget we shouldn't have bought the widget then who told us that we should have bought it and, and why did we go along with that decision these are some of the things when we look at the, the, the grander picture of the high school project and the fact that it went over budget by um, almost 20 million dollars and that it went behind schedule by several years these are the questions that this review would answer these folks um, and, and this is a uh, Hill International um, provided this particular proposal um, they're proposing fifteen thousand dollars for this plus um, travel expenses uh, and it would look at they would 
interview various individuals involved in the project. They would look at the project documentation. And they would basically come back to us with a report and say, okay, this is what went wrong. This is why it went wrong. And it, these are some of the things you can look at going forward to prevent this sort of thing from happening again. Uh, and this is, of course, what everybody's looking for. It's what town meeting asked for a number of years ago. Um, and I think it would be uh, a good way to tie up the loose ends, if you will, and uh, put this project to bed so that uh, the questions and, and the concerns raised about the management of the project, how it was run, how it was completed, um, we can put all that behind us at this point um, with such a report. And then we don't have to worry about you know, the next time we ask for money for a renovation project or, you know, as we saw this evening, we've got the potential for uh, a filtration project that would come before the town that would require an override. Uh, the last thing we want to do is see that project derailed because there are a lot of people who still have questions and concerns about how the town manages these sorts of large capital projects. Okay. And, uh, does anyone else have any comments? I, I have a few, and I'll, I'll make them. And, and uh, of course, money is is an evil here because I don't think the Board of Selectmen has the funds to be able to do this. Um, I don't totally disagree with this. I do want to ask Town Council a question, though, in regard to it. One is that I know that we have come to some settlements over the course of time with this project. Uh, We've settled uh, with the general contractor on some issues. We've settled uh, with a court judgment, I believe, with the original architect. Uh, by doing a report like this, would we jeopardize any of those settlements? I guess, and I know I'm going to ask you this off the cuff here. S sorry, Frank, but that, that's kind of why you counsel. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I believe most of those matters have been closed. We have settled and closed the case involving um, the architect. That was a jury verdict in the Principal Superior Court. We have settled and closed the case with the contractor, TLT. We did that through the mediation process. Um, and I don't believe there's any outstanding litigation at this present time, there, except for one case involving a subcontractor where we're involved in name only, but we don't expect uh, to be anything other than perhaps a witness uh, okay. in that particular case. So we wouldn't jeopardize I any of those those settlements by doing something like this? Uh, no, I don't believe so. Okay. Um, my, my, I, I, I sit and have sat uh, as the liaison of this board to the school building committee since uh, I, I want to say after the project became derailed when when the, the, the town kind of intervened and we had the town manager's office get involved and try to write the tracks as we move forward. And I know that the committee there has been um, reformulated and uh, we have some uh, very good uh, and knowledgeable folks on that committee now who have construction experience. Um, and there is some money available at the uh, in the project. So in other words, uh, the project is coming to its fruition, and I believe the project will be closed out sometime in the very near future. I know that we do have a school building committee meeting uh, scheduled from a week from this Thursday. Um, so my, if we were gonna do this, my only suggestion would be that we write a letter, come to some kind of resolution and write a letter to the school building committee and ask them, provide them the information we have and ask them to undertake that because um, if there were some mistakes made, I don't think anything was made purposely by any one individual. Um, but uh, it, it's evident that uh, um, we were able in the second phase to come in under budget, so maybe there was some um, mistakes made in the first phase. I, I, I am not going to sit here and throw stones at anybody or in any group, but uh, um, it might also be part of the process. Um, keep in mind, we have to take the low bidder in, in the state bidding process. Doesn't always mean that the, the most reputable bidder, the, the most uh, timely bidder, or, or, 
or, uh, or something of that nature. So those would be my suggestions, but uh, I'll leave it up to a board discussion. Pat? Well, I have a couple of comments sure. and a couple of questions. In reading the letter from Mr. Allen, the letter that he sent to you, Brent, um, he talks about a review, not an audit. And, you know, this is kind of uh, on the agenda as an audit. Yes, right. He also used the term forensic. And a forensic audit is usually one that's done because it implies that there's been fraud somewhere. That's what a forensic audit does, is really look for fraud, as opposed to just an audit of its own. So I guess my question would be is, what is this review? Is this going to be a review or an audit? And then what kinds of questions are going to be asked of the, if it's a review, what kinds of questions do we ask the person, not necessarily him, whoever is the, whoever, if it gets to that point, is going to do it? Or do they determine what they review and let us know what they're going to review and would, would that be satisfactory? I guess I'm not clear. I know what an audit does, but I don't know, and I know what a forensic audit does, and I would not really, usually they're very, very expensive. And I know that the, the numbers here are not that. But I know forensics audits on a project like that could come to anywhere from fifty to $100,000. So, um, so that's my question. Okay. Audit, review, and what, what is it to be, do you think? Well, it, based on my conversation, uh, this is not an audit. Like I said, this okay. is a review of the process. And, and quoting from the letter process. that he provided us, his use of the term forensic, he mentions the forensic construction experience of our staff, but he does say, and I think this goes to the point of the question, is our work has uncovered numerous unintentional cost issues, such as contract interpretation issues, design errors, project pre-evaluation errors, litigation costs, change order discrepancies, and other project management issues. And he said we can bring this experience to bear on, on the Falmouth project. And so I think those are the sorts of things that they look for. And in fact, in my conversation with him, he did say that they're not necessarily looking for um, uh, malfeasance, I intentional um, cost overruns and that sort of thing. A and he said in most of these cases, they've done a number of these sorts of reviews. In most of these cases, they don't find that anyway. He said they would begin their, and I don't like using the word investigation, their review and it, if it led them in that direction, obviously, then they would go in that direction. But generally, they're rarely brought in that direction. What happens is, is that they uncover these sorts of things, such as design errors or pre-project evaluation errors and so on. Um, and in fact, you know, one example um, that I can provide you from my own examination, and, and I'm by no means am I any sort of an expert in this, but I know, for example, that in some of the steel work that was done, a subcontractor um, neglected to completely review and evaluate the costs involved and, and some of the design work involved in the steel work in the construction, went back to the contractor and asked for more money. And that's where one of the subcontract disputes came into play in that the subcontractor said, well, we need to make these changes because there's a problem with the plans. And the contractor said, well, it's your responsibility to read the plans and to go through this process and make sure that everything is accurate. So these are some of the, the underlying issues that may be uncovered. I'm sure there's many more examples of this, obviously, because when we're 20, but $20 million over budget, you're going to have more than a few of these, I think. Great. Uh, uh, go ahead. I was going to say, there was always this, um, I wonder what to call it a rumor, but um, some sort of an understanding that when the school building committee started on this project that they never had the actual i think it's the term design build plans is that the term design build you know um when when there were from the previous um project you know when the school was built when that when a project like that is finished they're supposed to have those are called as, as, built, built. as, built. as built plans you're supposed to have as built plans and it was always seemed to come up time and again that when they started on the renovation, they never started with as-built plans. That in itself could cause a huge problem just from the beginning. But I don't know if that's true or not. Maybe that's a question to ask 
the, the uh, school building committee, did you have as-built plans when you started the project? And maybe in their opinion, what problems ensued because they learned they didn't have those plans to begin with? Uh, I mean, that to me would be a major fatal flaw from the get-go. I, I mean, I don't this entire project true. was a perfect storm. Right. In some form or fashion. Uh, uh, there's an old saying, you can't make chicken salad out of chicken feathers. And, and we had a high school that was originally designed uh, and then the problem was it was designed for an open classrooms. And we continued to remodel that high school as we went through by putting up walls that really didn't need to be where the walls were. And then all of a sudden we decided we were going to remodel this building. I mean, asbestos removal alone that we had no knowledge of was in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. So uh, um, hindsight being 2020, I think most people in this community would agree we probably should have built a new high school. I mean, we have probably 200,000 extra square feet at that high school than we need. And there are rumors out there the reason we remodeled was so that we'd have the extra square footage. I don't know. But the bottom line is uh, there is a multitude of those, uh, those things out there. Um, and uh, needless to say, we remodeled because we thought we were going to get more reimbursement. Well, the percentage was more, but, you know, you sell a hot dog and, and you make 80% on the hot dog, but you sell a lobster and only make 50%, do you make more money selling the lobster? That's my business. So in this case, the reimbursement maybe was, you know, the, the tail chasing the dog. And we, we met probably shouldn't have done a lot of things. But I don't know if this is going to be a witch hunt, and I don't want to get into a witch hunt personally because I think there were a lot of well-intentioned people who devoted a lot of time in this project and, uh, um, and didn't do anything maliciously themselves. But on the other hand, I think we can all learn from things as we move forward. So I'll, I'll waffle on that. Go ahead, Doug. I would like to support your idea that we see if the school building committee would take this on. School Partly building needs committee. school building committee, committee. The school not the school committee, right? The school okay. building okay. committee. Partly because I think they may still have control of the funds that has not been closed on that building. To have it come from them, I would think, would appear less of a witch hunt than having us step over it, and that they could use the money from the budget to look at it. What I would also encourage them to do is, if it's feasible to not only look at what went wrong there, but what went right in some of the other building projects that we've done in town and do a little bit of a comparison saying we've done some projects really well, they were under budget, on time, and this one wasn't. What can we learn from the differences between those two so that we can make sure that when we do our next building project and we have three or four ones coming up that we're doing the right thing? Well, I, I can tell you this, if we turn it over to them, I know they can't go outside the scope of that particular building with those funds. It's a great okay. idea. Right. It's a great idea, but I know they can't go outside of the scope with that funding. Uh, people are talking about a lot of things with that money, and we have to keep them focused on that one particular right. building. Okay. But um, well, the thing I like about I like Doug's suggestion in a sense because they are they have the most intimate knowledge of the project of anybody because they were there from the from the beginning, and maybe if they looked at it as uh, Doug suggested, they could say. You know, in retrospect, there are a lot of things we could have done differently or other things could have happened differently. And what are they and what can we learn from it? And how might they put that together as a kind of a, uh, if you're going to do this again, here are some things you really need to consider. Right. And, uh, but I will also say this. We have some volunteers over right, there. I know. And this is a volunteer board. I don't think it's in, within their it? scope. I can tell you this right now, that most of them did not sign up for a project that was going to be 10 years. Yeah. And they aren't at wit's end, you know, the ones that are still there. So if this is going to be done, I think it needs to be done, whether it's this particular company or something, some other company. I think, I don't think you can ask a volunteer committee to, to undertake this. No. Uh, I mean, they outside. can provide information, yeah. but I, I don't think it's fair and just to those folks that have finished this project. 
Go ahead, May Mark. I address a few of the, sure. the concerns raised? Um, first and foremost, the, the funds. Um, the reason why I bring this request forward at this point is because we're uh, pretty close, if not already beginning the budget cycle. Um, Fifteen thousand dollars, as proposed um, in this particular letter, is a drop in the bucket for both um, the town's budget of a hundred million uh, and the the project budget, which of course we spent um, many millions of dollars on legal fees in order to get that project back under control. So whether it's the town that funds this particular review or whether it would be um, done under the auspices of the building committee, um, it's, I think, small change in order to uh, give people peace of mind. I think one of the most important things, and it's been said many times by many people in government, including our own governor, um, who have said that the best way to uh, give the public confidence in what government does is to shed a light on things, is to open the doors and, and let light in. And this is letting the light in. Um, the settlements, Mr. Duffy, um, his comments uh, actually agreed because I had asked outside counsel about whether those settlements might be jeopardized. Outside counsel had said no. Um, so what Mr. Duffy just said agrees with what I've heard uh, previously that doing a review such as this isn't going to jeopardize anything that's already in place. Um, I'm perfectly uh, amenable um, to asking the high school building committee to fund this out of the, the, uh, the project funds. Um, I would, however, suggest that um, if we do that, that we ask that they be, those funds be spent under the authority of the board. Uh, and the reason why is twofold. Um, first is that the board, uh, per the town charter, is essentially the town's ombudsman. Um, we have under the charter the power of investigation. And this is, um, again, I, I dislike the word investigation, but this falls under that in terms of giving us the authority to review the work of other boards, committees, commissions, and work done by the town. And we would, in essence, by hiring some company to do this review, we would be delegating that authority. Um, and it's not something we haven't done before. We, we essentially did it with the boil water order a few years ago where we delegated that authority to the Board of Health to investigate that situation. Um, and the other reason um, why I would recommend that the, the money be spent under our authority is that the building committee um, would be part of this review. And while no one is suggesting that there's any malfeasance here, the reality is, is that you're asking a group to review itself and its own actions, which um, doesn't give the public the confidence that it's an impartial review. And that's where we talk about the, the issue of a witch hunt, and quite frankly, I'm always disturbed when I hear that term used, because when the big dig went over budget and behind schedule, nobody said that there was a witch hunt going on to find out why that project went over budget and behind schedule. And a lot of folks have equated this particular project and, and called it even Falmouth's Big Dig. The reality is, is we have a project that went considerably over budget, well behind schedule. It was the biggest single sum of money that the town has asked for from the public. And then it was the second single biggest sum of money to fix the project. Um, if this was a witch hunt, we could convene our own panel right here. But by asking an independent group that specializes in these sort of reviews to look into this project, we're essentially removing ourselves and any suggestions or possibilities of a witch hunt from that whole process. It's an impartial group of individuals who are simply asked to come in, look at this project, and explain to us what happened here. It gives the public the confidence that we are doing our job as the overseers, as the ombudsman for the town, and, like I said, it puts this whole issue to bed and allows us to move forward so that future projects are not jeopardized by questions surrounding this particular project. Uh, I'd like to ask a question of town council. Uh, this is $15,000 plus expenses. Uh, is, in a project like this, can they not bid something under $25,000 or would this have to be bid? Well, when you're under $25,000, you can do an informal procedure um, and that uh, you basically solicit proposals. But the one thing you have to do before you do that is to agree, agree on what the scope of work is going to be so that when you ask 
firm A and firm B and firm C, how much is it going to cost? They're all bidding on the same scope of work. You don't just go out and say, well, what will you do for 15000 What will you do for 15000 What will you do for 15000 You have to give them what you want them to do. You set the terms of what you want them to look at and what you want them to include in the report that comes back to you, and then you look for some quotes uh, from firms that will do it and do what you want them to do. Okay, so can I just uh, come up with a, uh, a hypothesis here? If we ask the school building committee uh, to uh, provide some funds for this board, uh, up to $25,000, for us to put out a request for proposals, and then we come up with a scope of work, I'd ask maybe Mr. Putnam to sit with the town manager to develop that scope of work. At least we have a idea of where you know the scope of work comes in right now someone already told us what the car costs in one particular area we might not be this company it might be another company that, that bids on it that's right um, is that within the realm for us to do something like that yes but one thing after we'll have to go back I was not prepared to talk about this subject entering the room tonight but a couple of things come to my mind one is that the town meeting voted to uh, have this money expended under the jurisdiction of the school building committee um, I have to go back and check those votes to see what authority they have. They, they uh, might be able, I'm sure they can cooperate with you folks on expending some money for, because this is certainly within the scope of the, of the project to have, to have reviewed. I don't have any question about that. But actually, who makes the decision to spend the money and how it's to be spent, I think, is by town meeting vote there. So that's a question that we, we have to look into. Um, the other thing is, <clears throat> I would really kind of caution using the investigatory powers of the board and even calling it an investigation because usually when you do an investigation you don't define a scope of services you simply say we want you to investigate a matter but i think this even in his letter he uses the terms review and analysis and i think that's a much more acceptable terms than saying we're investigating what happened. Well, I think what I, I know was, what he, you he mean, was right. saying that we I have know. investigative yes, powers. I, I, I think but I just it think out of that, context. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I agree with you, uh, but I think he was. No, I agree. Review oh, okay. and analysis, like I said, I've said several times tonight, the, the word investigation, it, it, I'm a little uncomfortable with yeah. that because it, it implies wrongdoing. Right. And like I said, in my conversations with these folks and, and uh, in the whole history of this thing, there's no evidence of malfeasance, and rarely does that sort of thing come up in these particular reviews. Yeah. Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman, yep. you to, to Brent. Would you feel more comfortable? I think the school building committee may still need the authority to pay the bill, but if we had the authority to choose which organization was going to do this, mm -hmm. do you think that would give the appearance at least of, of the oversight that you're looking for and give the public a feeling that we're stepping in there saying, Asking the committee, could you do this, but let us choose who's going to do the, the review and the analysis. I'm open to anything that will move this whole idea along. I think, and if I recall correctly, we did have an agreement with the um, school building committee to work more closely with them. I forget the details. Of we that. had a memorandum of understanding, right, right mm -hmm. that, that provided some, some uh, give and take with the town manager and the board of selectmen as we move forward. So. Um, I mean, I don't think that's inappropriate. A good suggestion that we can come up with the scope, right. ask them to allow us to choose, and then we'll let them fund it. And they, you know, they would they would actually be making the final decision. I, I think that for Brent and uh, Julian to come up with the scope is a great idea, at least as a starting point. To what have you suggested? I, I do have one question. Sure. Um, in the past, I know, and you sort of alluded to it with the, the less than $25,000, there's a, an RFP, but then I think it's known as an RFQ, which we could issue, and then we don't necessarily have to develop the scope. I think the RFQ sort of asks these sort of firms to come to us and say, this is what we would do for you. Yeah. I, is that a possibility here I, or no? It's the reverse. You have to come up with an oh, RFQ. Oh, you do? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, my, my suggestion would be is that uh, we're not taking any votes here tonight because it's not on the agenda maybe that we could ask the town manager to write a letter to the school building committee and explain what we've asked for tonight and see whether 
they would act on it uh, at their next meeting, which is a week from Thursday, and we'll hear back from them whether they're going to look favorably on this or not, or, and then we can go from there. Uh, I plan on being in attendance that day, so I might be able to uh, shed some light on what the board was looking for. Uh, but I really want us to, to make sure that we're all on the same page as we move forward. I think that's important, so I, I want to make sure that I hear from everybody. And yeah. make sure that I'm, we're I'm comfortable with that. Okay. You, you're not looking for a okay. vote? No, we're looking not looking for, for a vote, consensus. but I, we're looking for some consensus yeah. here. And the, the key word is to review the project. Mm -hmm. Okay? All right. So does that sound fine? Just look, look, ask the town manager to write him a letter on the board's behalf and see if they'd be willing to do that. Okay? Happy to. Thanks. Thanks. Yep. Desire. Okay. Next up is uh, to discuss and vote the Selectman Committee Liaison Policy. Uh, uh, I, just for the board's information, uh, uh, Vice Chairman uh, Putnam has graciously offered to take over uh, the liaison assignments, but uh, we've talked a little bit and think it's important that we come up with this liaison policy. Now, I, I, this is a working document. I surely have some changes I'd like to make to this document as well. So I think the word, the reason I put the word vote in here tonight is because it gives us the ability to vote it if we built consensus on it tonight. So, uh, if we don't build consensus, we surely can come back and, and vote on it uh, at our next meeting. Now, we have t spoken at length about the liaison policy, uh, um, you know, what their expectations are and our expectations. And I had some, some areas that I thought might need some work under the general policy responsibility. Uh, liaison duties include, and I, under A, I would like it to read something like, to keep informed as the committee's activities via their minutes and or contacts from the committee chairman. So this is a discussion period here. So I, I don't think it's realistic for the, the committees or this board to think that we're gonna be able to attend these meetings mm -hmm. on a timely basis. Um, if we're doing our due diligence as a member of the board of selectmen and doing our homework for our own meetings, sometimes it's very, very hard to do that. The other area that I'd like is the role of liaison is not to influence, uh, but I'd like to add in that or advocate for their assignments. In the past, we've had members of this board become advocates for a specific committee, and I don't think that's appropriate. Just because we're, we're the liaison does not mean that we're their mouthpiece. I think we speak collectively, collectively, I think it's important that a member of the board can can talk intelligently about what's happening in a committee. But I think we need to also put some onus back on the committee. Number one is if that particular liaison's not forwarded the minutes, well, the, the committee themselves are not helping. They need to keep the, the that member of the board in the loop. So I'm going to open this up as general discussion to the board. Okay. That? Well, I, yeah, I have a, several, but I'll okay, start sure, no, with we, we, one. Yep, working document. Committee, any multi-member, this is the liaison policy mm -hmm. for any multi-member body, a board committee or a commission. And then there's one called an assignment. Those are committees, individuals, or organizations. What individual would we serve as a liaison for? I... Yeah. I could answer that question. Oh. We, we oftentimes appoint individuals such as the constables and in the past of course we've had issues with communications with the constables and so the idea of this policy is to establish not only liaison assignments between this board and committees but between this board and some of these individuals such as say constables so we know that there's an avenue of communication between us and, and our appointees. For instance, the moderator, the, uh, the chair is the liaison to the moderator. The what? The chair is the liaison to the moderator. That's the, the individual moderator, right. that's right. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, I understand that. Oh, so that's what individuals needs. Okay. Um, okay. The um, I agree with you on the I that is term assignments. I guess I didn't quite understand what that meant. Now I now I see what you mean by that. Well, and Doug had it. I I can say this that Doug had emailed me and I, I shared that email with, with Brent. Some of these groups can be grouped together. Uh, and it would probably be very smart to do that. In other words, have one member represent things like uh, things that have to do with the housing, uh, because there's two or three committees that have to do with housing. Uh, uh, so th those, those are probably smart. But there are other things where we have selectmen appointments, like the Cape Cod Water Protection Collaborative. A selectman is supposed to be a member, and we don't. Uh, David resigned from that, and we don't yet have anyone assigned to represent us on the on the. So that would be to liaison to me would be the selectman right. that's assigned to that. And just because these and committees are listed here doesn't mean they have to, we have to choose the, all of these committees. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's important that we have no. the regulatory boards, but uh, I mean it, it's going to be up to the board here. Well, I'm thinking too, like the steamship. We have a, an appointed representative to the steamship authority on the board of governors. That person reports to us annually. So I don't know why we would need a liaison to the Steamship Authority because we have a governor. If he has an issue, he's going to come to the board because he's appointed by the board. Did you? Well, well I, the, the reason when the whole point of putting yeah. Steamship Authority in there is because we have that and, and there's another individual appointee that we appoint that individual to the Board of Governors and that the liaison would be that would be the interface between that appointee of the board and the board itself. So if that individual, say, wanted to come and bring a report to us, that they would contact the member of the board and who might in turn contact the chair, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. And my, the other comment I had was the last, um, the, in terms of the um, elected people, like Barnesville County government, state senator, state reps, they usually, they, their offices usually contact the town manager's office. I mean, they, the town manager's office has a very direct and frequent liaison with the state reps. We don't, for the most part. I mean, mm -hmm. we do have ceremonial connections. But in terms of issues like, um, the, like the representative staff, if there's a bill coming up, they'll notify the town manager. They don't notify us. So I would think that we wouldn't include them on our liaison list. Do you want to go right down the list of this? of these committees so that folks can get an idea if you want a group or whatever uh, or whether you, everyone thinks that we need to have representation on all of these committees well if I could there's sure. just one thing yep. I want to uh, mention yep. um, in item three you said the the role of liaison is not to influence their assignments and you wanted to add uh, or, or be advocates or, for or advocate for yeah. the the only caveat that I would have for that particular um, addition is that as elected officials, our job is to have an opinion. I mean, we're, we get elected based on a platform, based on saying we're going to do this or we believe that. And so there will be those moments in time when there may be an advisory board to the committee, say, for example, the Bikeways Committee, which has an idea. We love the idea, and we come back to the board, and, and we're trying to sell that to the board. That's the opinion that we hold. and. For us to, to, to say that we're not supposed to be advocates for something that an advisory committee is bringing to us, it's hard to do when we're elected to have an opinion and to advocate those opinions. I, I don't disagree, but we have had members in the past who have served as committee liaisons, mm -hmm. and they have been advocates for those specific committees mm -hmm. to the point where it was not just their particular political platform, they became the mouthpiece for the committee. And I don't think that's necessary. I think the committee themselves well, need to speak for themselves. But see, I think here is where we look at our statutory role in that in and of ourselves we have no authority whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Individually, we have nothing. We have no power, no authority. The only power we have is when we sit at this table and we work together. So my feeling would be if you're going to be a liaison 
and the committee wants to do something and maybe you agree it's a good idea, I would say to the committee, you bring it before the board mm -hmm. okay. because I don't have any power to, to suggest to you or even to tell you whether I think it's a good idea. If you think it's a good idea, and maybe you can say, I think that has merit and you might want to bring that before the board. So rather than taking on that, that's what you mean by an right. advocacy role. Stay out of that realm completely, right? Yeah, I, I agree with you. But you know, keep in mind that uh, David Bragger has brought forward some, he's gone to some meetings and he, you don't always know what's going on in a room unless you're in the room. I have a problem with some, some uh, aspects of the press who don't show up at a meeting and think they heard and saw everything because they watched it on tape. Body language and what's happening in the room makes a, a wealth of difference. So uh, those types of insights coming back from the board are very helpful. Uh, and keep in mind, every member of this board can go to any meeting, whether it's the liaison assignment or not. As a matter of fact, I would hope that you know we all do pop in, and I, you know, uh, uh, unannounced sometimes too, because we really get to know whether the board or committee is actually doing their job, uh, uh, or they're just putting on a show when the board of selectmen shows up. So uh, uh, that's open for discussion. I, I agree with you, but I don't want to see myself or anybody else carrying the flag for a specific committee uh, putting forward their agenda because I think it's important that we have opinions but not carry the ball for them. So, and the only other thing I would suggest is that committees here that have selectmen on them, which are very, like the EDIC is actually the only one that can have a selectman by charter. Well, the other the, the collaborative. Are a selectman specific representative instead of, I don't mean like a committee, like the CONCOM where we appoint everybody, but when there's an agency that we appoint someone to, like the collaborative, like the steamship authority, I would think that they should be the liaison to us, not us the liaison to them. Don't we also have someone on the Golf Advisory Committee? That yeah, we do. Yeah. We have someone on the... Uh, uh, we have some... The veterans? Veterans Council? Is that yep. on this list? There's a selectman right, representative so there. And, and I don't think, you know, I mean, those folks need liaisons as well as a selectman, so... The, um, well, I, a question for you, for the, yep. the Veterans Council. Um, the board in the past, it's usually, it's oftentimes been a member of the board. In this case, it's not a member of the board. So in, in these situations, would you have a liaison to the council then? Because there's not actually a member of the board sitting on the council at that point? He it's designated the selectman's representative. Right. I, I, I think it, I mean, I th there were times in the past, like give the same illustration, on the EDIC we had members that left. Pat was one of them that was a member of the board of selectmen but remained on as a selectman's representative Correct. on the EDIC for a while. Mm -hmm. um, so. 15 I, years. I'm right. <laughs> Our Just top a priority while. is to make sure we have liaisons to committees <laughs> where either we don't have a member or we don't have a representative. Mm. I think that has to be our top priority. Mm. And then the next ones can be, all right, are there other ones where we have a right. representative that we need a liaison? But I think first, right. let's make sure we're covering the committees, because there are a lot of committees here. Yeah. And I'd rather, you know, each one of us have four or five committees that we have no official connection to and make sure we have a liaison to that committee. That makes sense. I, I mean, like the Charter Review Committee. Uh, it's every five I mean, every, seven years. It's right. Uh, five years. And well, the timetable, is, that is. I know. This, this, this was a list that was thrown together based on looking at the Charter and, and the yeah. other things. And, the, and, and the as it notes in here, it's including but not limited to. Maybe it's too comprehensive. Maybe it's not comprehensive enough. No, no one's uh, bashing it. I'm yeah. just saying that that's why we're doing a little work yeah. session here. So... Uh, May I make a suggestion? Yeah, sure. That perhaps um, if we wanted to individually try to group these together rather than go through the list tonight and, yeah. and, and try to figure that out, and then um, we can come back with some suggested groups if we want to um, make liaison assignments by groups of committees as opposed to by individual committees or, you know, keeping them grouped together um, based on um, 
common interests or common tasks. That's or, a good idea. So the affordable house, the various yeah. affordable housing committees, or entities, I should say. And I have another question. Sure, go right ahead. What is the Regional Wastewater Implementation Committee? I couldn't find that anywhere. I looked in the book. Is it somewhere on the town's website, I think. <laughs> Do you, have you ever heard of that one? Have you heard of that one? I have not. Regional Wastewater Implementation. I don't know, that was a new one for me. Yeah. We better check that one out. All I know is that you're the liaison to it. <laughs> oh, yeah? <laughs> Thanks. Um, you know, I mean, and there are some committees, too, as we move forward. We might want to consider merging together. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, it's kind of like a program that you start, but no one ever it was, it, it was very relevant, the program could have been a teaching tool, and all of a sudden, 15 years later, you're still teaching that particular program, or have someone assigned to it, but it's not relevant anymore. Uh, and the last one, the local emergency, the LEPSI, I don't think we appoint LEPSI. Isn't that, isn't that sort of um, designated by, by its... Um, the, its purpose I think as to who's on really, it. Yes. Yeah, yeah it's kind it of like town employees are on Lepsi mm -hmm. rather mm -hmm. than. Uh, so I wouldn't think we would want to, because. You can double check. That. Yeah, uh, the vision of Fell. I don't know what that is either. That is, um, I was asked about being on that committee. Um, really? With, I was approached about two years ago. The chairman of the planning board. And oh, they were going to have yeah. someone from. They were doing a vision. But then it didn't work out. They never actually really ever had a first meeting. It was supposed to be meeting twice a month about the future vision of fire. And it never happened. So that's why it's on there, but it just never, never happened. So it's not really a committee. It's, it's, it's it just I, never took off. I think it was part of the, um, the um, local comprehensive planning committee. And they were going to start out by doing a visioning because visioning is part of the requirement of um, of the local plan, and I think that's probably what they were doing. Yeah. But it's not a, a formalized committee. All right. So maybe uh, again, this is a working document. We're trying to refine this a little bit more as we move forward. If anyone else has any additional comments, how about you email Brent them. And, uh, okay. but I want folks to also look at all of these committees and come up with some ideas where you think we could maybe merge assignments under affordable or, or, you know, like housing or something of that nature. I mean, there are some things here with buildings, like town building committee that could be associated with a bunch of different things. Right. Does it make sense so at least take a few minutes to try to eliminate to some of them tonight? The, that was my original suggestion, but I, I mean, we could go right down the list. Do you want to go right down the list and see what we can cross out right now? Well, I'd start at the bottom. The Lepsi, I would eliminate. Uh, I think the state representative, state senator, we're going to, that's done through the town manager, the Brownsville County government. I don't think we need a liaison. Well, let's start, we'd start from the back or the front? I'm starting from the back because those are the ones that are more obvious to me. Okay, so you say, say in the uh, state rep, State Senator. State Senator, Bounceable County Government. Vision of Falmouth, we, it hasn't been happening. Uh, Steamship Authority, I guess we have an appointee. And we do have a report from the Steamship Authority rep, I believe it's twice mm -hmm. a year. Uh, at this point, the Regional Wastewater Implement Committee. Um, EDIC, we have a representative to it, is that correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Charter Review Committee is not going to be in existence much longer right, right. And, and they've I mean they when they want anything they call a chair anyway so it's a five once every five years right okay and that's at least where I would get to start with eliminating those and then I think there's some grouping we can do but probably not in a meeting of this set about the front page the water protection collaborative that has a selectman that's right hmm? Right. And then the and the board of assessors. I mean, their well, their work is totally statutory, and we don't even know. I mean, yeah, we well, don't I, get involved I, in that. I really? tend to. Hmm? I tend to agree with you there. 
I think that's fair. I've never seen them come before us except never. for an appointment. Never. Do we appoint a representative of the cable advi the cable advisory committee also? That's me. We do. Re we do. But not as a liaison, but as a representative, right? Uh, well, I was a liaison. No, okay. the cable advisory committee yeah. is just an advisory committee, like bike wise. Okay. Yeah. Do we want to leave the Veterans Council on there? Or, because we have our rep, that rep should actually be responding to us. Mm -hmm. At this point, I would, I would eliminate it for now. Well, I guess the question, I, I still have that question about the fact that we have a rep on there. However, that individual is not a member of the board. Yeah. And ultimately, yeah. The, the, the idea behind liaisons yeah. is basically so that the chair doesn't get pummeled by requests right. from every board committee and commission to get on the agenda or to seek assistance or whatnot, so that there's a conduit besides the chair to sort of you know, spread the load, if you will. Who would the Veterans Council come to then if they okay, had a we'll concern or a question? That. We'll leave that one on there then, especially while we don't have a representative on it. We don't have a Transportation Management Commission. I mean, that's never been reconstituted since everyone resigned. Okay. Yeah, there's mm -hmm. four or five openings on that, so yeah. But the, why don't we they leave don't that there because well, that might be able to move together with some something other committee. else? Yeah, because so, transportation, yeah. I think, is going to be very important. There's a I, I know. Issue. Yeah. Maybe we can put, put I think it with something a, else to, to come up with a put committee that. With the same Well, maybe with the bikeways oh, committee. Oh, the bikeways right? committee. You know, that's that's transportation. Okay, so at least we've knocked off a few here. Yeah, the only one I, I foresee adding is in probably a month or two, two months, we're going to be adding for the bylaw revision, which is way overdue, which is him and I are, are working well, on. We won't need a liaison if you two are on it. No, right. Yeah, <laughs> but it's just I don't know if you want to have it listed as a, okay. eventually. Okay. Careful, we may be yeah. volunteering ourselves. You already did. <laughs> well, Frank is still yeah, coming. Let's make yeah. that quite clear. <laughs> well, the guy who's going to run the it. The two of you volunteered for that. Frank is well, Frank is here. Can we clear that up? The bylaws committee. Can you explain your role with the bylaws committee? I'm bylaw review committee. Um, I've been on two bylaw review committees. I know the charter you're supposed to have one every five years. <clears throat> one of the articles that this charter review committee um, is going to present to you next week involves the bylaw review committee. I've suggested, and we were suggesting that the model be changed. The existing provision in the charter really isn't working. Um, first of all, it's uh, the bylaw should not be reviewed every five years. They should be reviewed all the time. And we're suggesting uh, also that a five-member committee is not good and not, not enough people to do the job. It's a very daunting task and there's a lot more work. So um, we're suggesting that the, that the bylaw, that the selectmen have um, latitude and discretion in reviewing the bylaws. It's something that they should be doing on a regular basis. That if you would like to appoint a committee to look at certain bylaws, you can do it and appoint another committee to look at other bylaws. Because the people you have sitting on these committees might have different skills or different interests. It's very hard to find five people who can serve on a committee to review all of the bylaws of the town. It's, it's almost too much to ask. So as a result, the first bylaw review committee I think proposed several amendments to the to the bylaws. The, the next one really didn't because we kind of ran out of gas. We had a number of people who had physical ailments were unable to come to meetings. Uh, there was also a lack of interest on some people's part. But it, it doesn't mean that the bylaws are not being reviewed. In fact, they are being reviewed by departments, um, by my office, by the town manager's office. The work is actually getting done. It's just how how do we assemble people to do it? That is has been the issue. Oh. Okay. Yeah, I think you talked these two out of it by doing that. You know? <laughs> well, uh, you know, it's a very it, it is a, what you what you really have to do is you have to organize it. You take each section of the bylaw, and you send a subcommittee or you send somebody out to the department and say, okay, let's sit down and look at your bylaw, and then you 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 take a look at it, um, and you come back and you work on amendments that may improve it or change it. And another thing you do is you send somebody out to look at what other towns have done. And I think one of the best ways of, of, of finding proposed amendments to the bylaws is to not reinvent the wheel, but see what other towns have done in the way of developing bylaws to solve their problems. And then come back with a report to you folks and say, this is what we think may, may help. 
uh, is actually quite a bit to be done. Oh, yeah. Okay. Interesting. All right. So we're going to get some this working document to keep working on it. Yeah. And I'll put it mm -hmm. on another agenda maybe a, a couple of weeks. Just so you, the board knows. So I believe it's September the 24th. We're going to have a little workshop on uh, pay as you throw. And I've asked the professional staff. Uh, we'll be making a decision. Everyone knows that uh, the town received a grant and uh, the grant is due to expire the 1st of October unless the board, in fact, uh, votes to extend that grant. Um, I think it's important that we just have the Board of Selectmen look at this issue. I know there's been groups out there that have been doing their own education on it, solid waste. Um, but I think it's important that the board get a, a fair and uh, a very broad range presentation from our uh, professional staff and so we can make some decisions as we move forward. Okay. If I could be a little pushier on the liaison policy, just that I'm not a liaison to any committees officially and feel that I've been here for a while and I should start getting some work done on that. Um, I would hope that either next week or the week after we could actually get those established. The liaisons themselves? Yeah. Okay. So next week we're not meeting, so we'll have in two weeks, put it right. on the agenda in two weeks. Great. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Next up is uh, approved minutes of a meeting of August the 20th. This was sent out today. Uh, does anybody, everyone have a chance to review those? Yes, I have, um, I find it here. On page one, mm -hmm. um, down at the bottom of the page, item A, which was appoint two selectmen to serve on the Capital Advisory Committee. Um, that was a motion by um, David to appoint Doug and Brent, and I seconded the motion. Okay. So it wasn't just the appointment. It was, we a actually vote. had a motion, a second, and a vote, and it was all in favor. Okay. So it was just like a regular vote, a motion, a second, and a vote to appoint Doug Jones and Brent Putnam, which it states here that that's who. So it wasn't, the chairman didn't appoint them, the board appointed them. Okay. Mm-hmm. You, you've taken two weeks off this summer. Well, <laughs> that was the yeah, well deserved. Trust me. Yeah. That's okay. That was the only thing. That's it. Do I have a motion, Mr. Uh, Chairman? Can yes. I have an item? Oh, yes, okay. sure can. On the uh, on the last page in the town manager's report, very minor, but on the last bullet point, uh, the word is set S E T, and it should be sent with an N. Sent to D E P this month. Okay. Okay. And um, was there a, on page seven, um, on uh, Kevin's uh, report, was there a clause missing on your last bullet that you drove around the town after the road race and saw the, the, the damage at Falmouth Heights? Was it just saw the damage or saw that, I couldn't remember what you had reported. Uh, I, I reported that, the, let me see, I it's, saw the damage at Falmouth Heights and, and uh, observed, I believe, that would be the, that uh, the cleanliness of the of the road race route. Oh, you saw the um, you saw the condition of, of the, the of the Heights part field, the of the track. field. Yes, yeah. the damage at Falmouth Heights field. Okay, yeah. but not and noticed the and also noted the pickup and cleanliness the, right. the pickup yeah. and cleanliness of the road race route in surrounding neighborhoods. I guess that would be the best way to put that. Okay. So I have a, do I have a motion with those corrections? A so motion. Second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Ayes have it. Um, the next up is, uh, and I've asked the uh, Mr. Duffy to 
explain a little bit. The Board of Selectmen is uh, going to enter into a, a settlement agreement with the DEP and with the boil water order um, that uh, the Board of Selectmen, well, the Town of Falmouth had uh, violated um, a few years back. So if you can come up and explain the, what the Board has negotiated through uh, Town Council and uh, the State Attorney General's office. You're all aware of the uh, incident we had in June of uh, 2010 where we had to uh, issue an order to boil water because of the event that happened at Long Pond. Uh, there were a number of problems that resulted uh, when the pond turned over, I think was the term Mr. <coughs> um, Jack used. Um, so take that forward about another year or so uh, to maybe 15 months to September of 11. Um, I received a call from the Attorney General's office in the, in the person of uh, Matthew Ireland, who was an Assistant Attorney General in the Environmental Division, saying that the Commissioner of uh, the Department of Environmental Protection had sought the assistance of the Attorney General um, in crafting a, an order um, or an enforcement order um, with the DEP against the Town of Falmouth for violation of the regulations uh, with respect to the operation of the drinking water system in Falmouth. Um, they summonsed us to a meeting uh, which took place at the DEP headquarters in Lakeville. The meeting um, was two months later. It was on the 22nd of November in, in 2011. Um, I attended the meeting along with Mr. Suso, Heather Harper, and Ray Jack. Um, there were a number of people from DEP there and also Mr. Ireland of the Attorney General's office. Um, and they didn't really tell us anything we didn't know. Uh, we knew there had been violations of the regulations. Um, so what we were there to do was to try and discuss what would be the appropriate remedy for DEP in the terms of an enforcement order. And that began a, a series of meetings that we had uh, along with telephone conversations and letters back and forth, so, so on and so forth. It started out with the uh, Attorney General and the DEP uh, determining that there had been 26 violations of their regulations. There were four violations um, that ran for five days and one violation which ran for six days. That's a total of 26 violations um, of the drinking water regulations uh, that were associated with that event in June of 2010. The violations include total coliform bacteria, E. coli bacteria, uh, chlorine residual reporting requirement, which was not met, a failure to follow an approved response plan, which was not met, and also uh, failure to notify the Department of Environmental Protection when certain events took place that eventually led to the boil water order. Now, under the regulations, as they are published, there's a maximum penalty of $25,000 per day. So if you take 26 violations times $25,000 per violation, there is a maximum exposure of $650,000 that the Town of Falmouth could be looking at for violating the uh, drinking water regulations. We continue to negotiate and discuss uh, a possible resolution of this and eventually um, we came to, we learned rather, uh, that the uh, Department of Environmental Protection had determined that the appropriate fine would be $89,000. Uh, it was not explained to us how they arrived at that figure, but that was the point that they were going to use to negotiate a settlement with the town of Falmouth. We were then uh, asked, <sighs> or offered the opportunity, perhaps is the best way to put it, to engage in what is called a Supplementary Environmental Project, or an SEP. And under an SEP, we were allowed to propose certain acts or projects that we would undertake as a town that were responsive to the boil water order uh, that would allow us to get credit against the fine. Um, the a supplementary environmental project, or a SEP, 
it's a credit against a proposed uh, fine, but the credit that they're going to give us is totally discretionary. A SEP uh, must be proposed by the town, which we did. We submitted a number of proposed SEPs. Must be related to the problem, that is the water quality going into our water system. And must represent a commitment to the town, uh, by the town to respond above and beyond normal response activity. Um, we proposed a number of SEPs. Uh, one of them is that uh, some were not accepted, by the way. One is a water systems operation plan. Um, another is a chlorination study. Mr. Jack can give you some of the details of that. We committed to spend about $50,000 on those SEPs. Uh, then there are some other SEPs that we proposed where they were, uh, they agreed to give us nominal credit. One is a case study where Mr. Jack appeared at the Massachusetts Water Works Association annual meeting in Taunton, and he spoke to his contemporaries at other water works in Massachusetts about what happened here so that they could learn from our mistakes. We also agreed to do a watershed management plan for the Long Pond watershed. As you know, one of the issues that we had is that it's a kettle hole. And when we had that tremendous rainstorm in June of 2010, a lot of the water just came roaring down. Uh, the sides into the pond caused, it to, caused the pond to turn over and caused a lot of the suspended sediments. We also had an issue with notifying the public. Um, the efforts to notify the public, we relied at that time on the, nine one, uh, the reverse 911 system of the Barnstable County Sheriff's Office. That did not prove to be satisfactory. They did not have the capacity to get the number of messages out to the citizens of Falmouth warning them of the boil water order. Um, the efforts were suspended overnight because I guess people weren't answering their phone or <laughs> whatever. Um, so one of the things we did it, is um, we agreed, or we proposed to purchase an electronic message board. Now, an electronic message board, we already have two of them. These are those boards that are on trailers that are parked on the side of the road as you're entering town, and they convey a message. Uh, the Steamship Authority, I think, has a permanent one up on Route 28 telling you where to go to park your car. Um, it's a $15,000 board. We agreed to purchase uh, one of those. Of course, in the meantime, the 911 system has been resolved, I think, because the county has a new system that would be able to handle our, the capacity of calls. But that was one of the problems we had. We were unable to get the message out. So um, we proposed these uh, SEPs, and the total amount of money that we have agreed to commit to these SEPs is in a magnitude of about $85,000. So for this effort that we have agreed to undertake on behalf of the town, the DEP has, has given us a credit against the $89,000 fine of $29,000, meaning that we owe a fine of $60,000. The, the fine of $60,000 is due in two installments. One is due now. I happen to have a check in my briefcase over there for the first $30,000. The other half is due at the end of November. We asked the uh, Attorney General if they would give us to some date past the November town meeting, so if we needed to make an arrangement uh, with our finances and with our budget, we could do it. And they agreed to do that. Um, one of the, uh, when I was here reporting to you, I think it was in June, with the proposed terms of the settlement, one of the things you asked me to negotiate on your behalf, and which I did, was I, uh, you wanted to make sure we would not be disqualified from receiving any of these state revolving fund zero interest or low interest loans for any um, water or wastewater infrastructure projects in the future. And they have agreed to put a provision in there that we will not be disqualified or this will not be held against us for that purpose. So we will have the ability to apply for and receive SRF loans for our future uh, water and wastewater infrastructure projects. And of course, I think we're looking into a future when there's going to be a lot of those. So uh, following up with the negotiations, 
I have with me today a settlement agreement and a uh, consent to a judgment. The Attorney General is going to be filing this settlement agreement and the final judgment in Superior Court uh, later this week or early next week. This will be entered into the records of the court as a judgment against the town. It is a judgment in the form of an injunction which says that the town of Falmouth will operate its water system in complete conformity with all of the regulations of the Department of Environmental Protection and all of the water quality regulations that are contained therein. And if there is a knowing and intentional or even a negligent violation of these regulations in the future, we could be facing some very serious problems. But of course, it's our obligation to operate our water system in accordance with the regulations anyways, and it's our obligation to take them seriously and, and to obey them. So we're really agreeing to do what we should do, what we have an obligation to do. But we do, uh, this is hanging over us, and it will be hanging over us for a while, indefinitely, actually. Um, so if we have future problems and we fail to comply with the regulations, we could be looking at more serious fines. Um, throughout all of this, I relied upon Mr. Suso, Mr. Jack, uh, Patrick O'Neill who's here, who was very helpful in helping us negotiate this. Um, it was a process that took some time, but we were able to get it done. Uh, I think this has been a very difficult period in our history, particularly the Water Department, but it's behind us. Uh, a lot of work has been done since then. Mr. Jack can explain to you uh, perhaps what his department intends to do with respect to these particular SEPs and how they'll be implemented. There's also some other things that, has been, that have been done, um, the uh, filtration thing that uh, project that was talked about earlier is mentioned in this agreement as something that the town of Falmouth has undertaken as evidence of, our, of the seriousness of our purpose. Um, also, we have undertaken uh, a number of efforts to bring new training to the people who were um, involved in, in running the water department. We had to postpone that for a while because, as you are quite aware, there's been a turnover of personnel at the water department, so we wanted to make sure we got the the new people on board before we undertook that. Um, the Board of Selectmen is being asked by the Attorney General to sign this agreement to acknowledge, uh, basically put your name on the line that the Town of Falmouth is taking this seriously. They're asking me to sign it too, and I'm here to sign it with you. Okay. Um, I think it's important for the public to note that uh, this has been a long process that the Board of Selectmen has been involved in, uh, the negotiations. The Board of Selectmen has been briefed in executive session over the last several months from Town Council. The Board of Selectmen has offered some suggestions in the settlement, and some of those su uh, suggestions have been accepted by the Attorney General's office. Some of them have not been. but. Uh, the board, I believe, feels comfortable to move forward with this settlement, learn from our mistakes, and uh, we do plan on uh, voting at a future meeting, a protocol of when any violations uh, um, happen or occur, and how the, the town of Falmouth will handle these violations, meaning uh, uh, not violations to the DEP standard, but uh, I guess I misspoke by saying the word violations, how we will handle any uh, errors or, or positives within our water system. So uh, the Board of Selectmen will be taking that up in the very near future, the protocol. But in regard to this settlement, the Board has worked actively with Town Council, with the professional staff, to come to uh, a final conclusion on this. Uh, does anyone else from the board have any other comments? Uh, and if not, uh, well, I was just going to say that if, in fact, an event would occur event. with relate to related to our water system that would require us to report that event to DEP, that protocols will do that. Doesn't necessarily mean an error or a, a violation, but an event of some kind. Well, most of uh, our problem, frankly, was the reporting. Was the reporting? Um, there, are, there are events in communities where problems happen with the water system, as long as you report them 
time in a timely manner and you act upon an appropriate response plan that's mostly what the regulations call for okay. okay so I'd be looking for a motion to enter into a settlement agreement with the Attorney General's office in regard to the boil water order so move second motion in a second any discussion from the board all those in favor aye, aye. opposed I have it. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to take a couple of minutes of your time and circulate the document. That's fine. That signed. And many thanks to the three people in the back row. Yeah, very true. <laughs> to help bring this about in a positive way. Chairman, if I might, as a town yes. manager, just make a comment. I want to echo uh, town council Frank Duffy's comments and, uh, and thanks and appreciation for uh, really uh, excellent teamwork regarding this uh, very difficult and challenging uh, situation in which the town uh, found itself. And uh, uh, really, all things considered, a, uh, a uh, an acceptable and appropriate uh, negotiated outcome. And uh, we appreciate also the uh, commitment of uh, representatives of the DEP and the Attorney General's office in moving this forward and uh, creating, uh, recognizing positive steps the town has taken, you know, continue to take. And uh, the board, of course, heard a status report on a very important part of that earlier this evening. So we look forward to that, the options on uh, potential water filtration coming forward as well. So I want to thank all parties and uh, the board, of course, for your uh, patience and commitment to seeing this through as well. And we are committed to uh, handling it uh, appropriately in all times to come. Okay. Thank you very much, Council. Right. Um, next up would be the uh, town manager's report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A couple items. It was my pleasure to, to attend the uh, press conference on uh, this past Thursday afternoon at which uh, Cape Wind confirmed their intent to locate their administrative and maintenance operations within Falmouth Harbor, resulting in the, cre in the creation of at least 50 permanent jobs for uh, engineers, scientists, and technicians involved on a day-to-day uh, -day basis with the operations of the Cape Wind project. Also on Friday of this past week, I was pleased to attend the press conference held by the State Department of Conservation and Recreation announcing a $50,000 grant to the Town of Falmouth to supplement the funding already set aside uh, by town meeting uh, for critical repairs to the Tides bulkhead uh, in Falmouth Harbor. My thanks to all for the uh, uh, comprehensive support on this. And uh, members of the board, I just wanted to confirm, of course, that uh, this upcoming uh, Monday, September 3rd, uh, Town Hall will be closed for the uh, Labor Day holiday. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Okay. Um, before I ask for individual selectmen reports, I'd like to remind folks, again, that there's a Charter Review Committee meeting. It's a public meeting of their potential changes on this Thursday, August the 30th at 7 p.m. at the Falmouth Main Library. Uh, I'll open it up to any individual selectmen reports. I, I can say that my, my report would be that I attended both of those press conferences with the town manager and uh, 
represented the board there as well. Uh, it's important to note the Cape Wind project, if it comes to fruition, would add 50 good paying jobs in the Falmouth community as well as the opportunity to keep our harbor a working harbor um, and uh, keep it uh, something that it has some marine purpose as well. Uh, it was nice to see the uh, Parks and Recreation Committee, uh, the state parks uh, group come down and um, help us leverage the funds we have for our tides bulkhead. And uh, I know S Senator Murray was there that day as well. And it was quite evident that her tenacity helped the town uh, got, get the, the $50,000 additional funding for the tides bulkhead. So uh, it's imp very important to note that uh, uh, she continues to work on our behalf. Uh, any other, Doug? Uh, in addition to those two events, <coughs> I, I was also at an event on, earlier on Friday morning at a Webner, uh, who has received uh, over a million dollars to support their efforts uh, and their educational ventures that they're doing on the estuarine um, and the protection of the water bodies there. And uh, the, we had uh, Mr. Keating at all those three events also, and the support for the town of Falmouth by both our state and federal uh, representatives has been quite significant and very, very impressive. Great. Anybody else? I was at both of them, too. I know, Pat. You, <laughs> you, you, well, I don't you know how you keep the whole schedule together. Well, I missed schedule. the chamber one, so. All right. Okay. Um, do I have anything other business? How about a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Um, just for folks, uh, before we close, I call for the vote. Uh, there will be no meeting next week, Monday. The Board of Selectmen will not be meeting next week. So I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Thank you very much. Welcome to Falmouth. If you're a visitor, this is where surf and sun meet for fun. If you're a resident, this is where you'll find the businesses and the resources necessary to fill all of your needs. If you're a business person, this can be your home. Join with other men and women who work together to make this a sustainable economy year-round. Welcome to Falmouth Cape Cod.